Hi everyone, thanks for coming um, to the webinar. I'll go through what the BSG is about um, now quickly and then we'll get on to why you're all here um, to hear from all the panellists. So um, the aim of this webinar is to look at post PhD career options and talk to both applied and academic geomorphologists and also hear from Holly about advice on how you can apply for a career following your PhD in both academia and applied geomorphology. So this is the plan we have for this evening. Um, first, we've got the introduction to the BSG and just what the BSG is about and how it can benefit you as a postgraduate. And then we're going to hear from the panel and they'll all introduce themselves. And then there'll be the chance to ask any questions you have about post PhD careers or any directly to the panelists as well. Um, so you can use the chat or raise your hand um, using that function on Zoom and then you can unmute yourself to ask the questions. Um, and then Holly is going to give us a talk on post PhD careers and advice in geomorphology. And then for the networking part of the evening, we've got a quiz, which is like a Buzzfeed, Buzzfeed style quiz and which landform are you so you can find out which landform are you which I'm sure you're already keen to do um, and we'll go into breakout rooms and do that and get to know other geomorphologists which has been kind of hard this year and so who are we we're the BSG postgraduate forum um, that's me Erin um, then we've got Ollie, Sam, Tim, Marina, Guy, Holly, Ethan and Chrissa um, and we're part of organising these events and we're part of the BSG society as a whole and um, there's always space for new members. So if you want to become a member of the BSG Postgrad Forum and help us organise these webinars, just get in touch. Um, you can just send me an email or send an email to the BSG Postgrad's email that's been spamming you um, about this webinar. Um, and then who are the BSG? So the BSG is actually 60 years old. And it used to be called the British Geomorphological Research Group. And then it became broader um, and they changed the name of the society to the British Society for Geomorphology. There's currently around 600 members and about 50% of these are postgraduates. So there's quite a lot for postgraduates to get involved in and even more reason for us to host postgraduate events considering we make up such a large proportion of the membership. Um, what are the benefits of joining the BSG? So broadly, you can contact with a worldwide body of geomorphologists. There's also access to the Earth Surface Process and Landforms Journal, um, and that's really useful for Professional geomorphologists often say this because they don't actually have access to journals in their job, so they find this really um, positive thing about the BSG. Um, we also have electronic newsletters and a photo competition each year, which is a bit of fun. As postgraduates, there are also particular benefits for you um, for joining the BSG. So there's quite a lot of postgraduate grants. There's an outreach grant, um, a conference attendance grant and a research grant. Um, so do look into those. And if you're interested in applying for any of those, webinar two, we had Dr. Rachel Smedley, who was the grants officer for the committee. And she basically told us loads of tips and tricks on applying for grants. So when we upload that to YouTube, um, keep your eyes peeled because it's really helpful. Um, and when you're after your PhD, which I'm guessing what most of you are here to find out about, um, there's also early career researcher grants, and these are £5,000. And based on the lack of grants that have been given out recently due to COVID, they're hoping to increase this to £7,500 in September. Um, and these are basically grants that help you pump prime your research um, and like start doing the smaller tasks and the field work to develop um, your research that you can apply for these really big grants. Um, so they're really useful um, and things, something to look out for. And then in terms of awards that benefit postgraduates, um, this photo here is of Duna Rhoda Baluda, and she won the Dick Chorley Award um, in 2020. And this is the award for the best um, postgraduate paper um, to come out of like your PhD. Um, so that's really exciting. And another opportunity for a postgraduate in the BSG. So if you wanna keep in touch and follow the events we're putting on, um, you can follow us on Twitter or send us an email. And um, we've also got Techniques Tuesdays on at the moment. So if you want to share anything about your research or a paper that you've just published, just get in touch using the form um, there and we'll promote it on our Twitter page. And you can also DM us. Um, and BSG League of Landforms is also a um, great event. That was earlier this year, but I'm sure there'll be another one in 2021, 2022. <laughs> um, yeah, so Holly, I guess, do you want to move on to introduce our panelists? 
Absolutely. Thank you so much, Erin. Okay, so um, each of our panel members is now just going to give a quick kind of uh, up to two minute intro about um, who they are, their background and kind of what they're bringing to the panel today. Um, so I'm just going to go through it on the order that you see on the slides in front of you. So um, sorry, Matthew, you are the first speaker. So um, could you please tell us a little bit about yourself? No problem. Hello. Um, so where to, uh, I'll start with where I started my academic career. I started it in Durham University I did a physical geography degree um, just because I had a weird obsession with rivers that hadn't that hadn't been realized yet and then and then I sort of because Durham was such a strong research community I stayed there and carried on and did um, a research master's there um, in kind of hyper zone water quality freshwater pearl mussel um, recruitment all on the river esque in North Yorkshire so I really loved that but I wasn't a fully fledged geomorphologist then I'd have considered myself a hydrologist um, but then I kind of fell into a PhD in um, I say fell because this whole time I'd never planned to do masters and PhD so <laughs> it was kind of accidental the whole way through but I then I moved to Northampton uh, to do a PhD in um, agricultural diffuse pollution uh, mitigation which is quite an applied PhD anyway um, so I did that for four years and then sort of almost immediately um, moved into the job I've got now which is geomorphology technical specialist at the environment agency um, and this is where I've had to write down what I do for my job because it's so confusing I do so many different things <laughs> um, but basically as a, as a geomorphologist at the EA you're you're basically an advisor and you give kind of your expertise to all different kinds of people it's a massively varied job so it was quite a big learning curve you're kind of you do river restoration projects, um, anything from floodplain reconnection, rewilding, beaver introduction, all of the sort of trendy uh, projects like NFM, um, weir removal, just anything. We can work with partners and do all kinds of fun things. But then you also, you also can review any kind of development or permitting that goes on anywhere near a river, anyone that wants to do anything and has to apply for a permit or planning permission, for example. You, you get oversight of that. So you get to uh, review the applications and make sure they're not deteriorating a river or finding opportunities for where you can perhaps get improvements for the river at the same time. So you're kind of, you're an overseer of everything going on. And it's honestly, in my opinion, the best job in the world. Uh, so I'd love to tell you more about it later, but that's kind of me in a nutshell. <laughs> that's brilliant. Thank you so much. And uh, we'll move quickly on to uh, Yui. So um, if you could introduce yourself, please. Yeah, hello, I'm, I'm Edward Olmos. Um, if, you, if you could put the slide up that I sent to Aaron. Great, excellent. So I work at the Environment Agency as well, and uh, I'm a senior specialist hyphen coast. I'm a geomorphologist that doesn't sit in the geomorphology team, which is a, a weird thing in a way in, uh, in the Environment Agency, but I basically, and anything to do with the coast on the southeast coast uh, in terms of how we are going to manage this in the future, interaction with local people, with local authorities, um, how we well, basically give up the coast and what the consequences of that might be. Anything along those lines is, is what I'm doing. And like, likewise, like Matilda, this is the best job ever. But um, just to show how difficult it is, to find the best job ever. I mean, just looking at the time scale. So this started off and the bottom left hand corner is all in Germany. So I originally wanted to become a geophysicist looking at, 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 uh, at volcanoes. Uh, and that was sort of slightly frightened off by the physics study that, that is involved in that. Briefly branched out to a carpentry apprenticeship and then thought, well, I always wanted to become a school teacher. So I studied uh, geography and PE while doing my last year's geography, uh, basically a project, I, I fell for the mountains and I fell for uh, rock glaciers uh, amongst all of them. You, you go up a little, a little valley and you see this thing and you think, what is this? Um, but, but then I was torn between mountains and coasts uh, because I spent a year in Aberdeen University and, and obviously every weekend you, you, you were just looking at the weather, sort of where I go to the coast, where I go to the mountains. And I happened to chance upon similar sort of just, we never knew this beforehand, on a, on a PhD on, on the last ice age in Peru, so back to the mountains. Uh, and then you obviously can't find a job with this topic. Um, so I, 
actually did the teacher training so sideways again and then I, I switched I, I accidentally again <laughs> came to the UK for half a year and then sort of 10 postdoc contracts later um, after about six years uh, luck ran out I went into a coastal consultancy and only in, in this sort of period I actually got into coasts again and ever since then since 2009 I, I, I've worked for the environment agency and and that took basically um, well probably 40 odd years to 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 get to the home that you're really comfortable in Thank you so much. That's really great to hear all about your, your career pathway. So thank you so much. Uh, we'll move uh, on to Fiona now. If you um, can unmute, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Holly. Um, and thanks, all of you, for inviting me to be a member of the panel. It's just so nice to get a chance to, to kind of chat with the postgrad members of the society. Um, yeah, so I'm Fiona. I'm an assistant professor at Durham University. Um, just less than two years I've been there. So before that, I was doing a bunch of postdocs. Um, I'm also the research secretary for the BSG. Um, so I'm involved in the committee that's kind of evaluating the grant applications. So I'm happy to also, you know, take any questions or answer any emails about applying for some of the society's grants as well, um, if anyone wants. Um, so I'm originally from Scotland. Um, I did my undergrad degree at Edinburgh in geology and physical geography. Um, and I liked Edinburgh so much that I stayed there for a PhD as well. So my PhD was kind of looking at, I guess, controls on river networks and mountain landscapes. So I was kind of looking at what's the density of channels? How does that correlate to uplift rates and things like that? And I kind of developed this real interest in using LIDAR data and digital topography to kind of understand uh, the shape of landscapes. And that's what I've continued to do for the rest of my career following then. Um, so, yeah, following, gosh, my whole life in Scotland before that, and then 10 years in Edinburgh, I did a bit of a detour where I moved to the US to do a postdoc at the University of Minnesota um, at St. Anthony Falls Laboratory. So there I was looking at mapping terraces along the upper Mississippi, um, which is still a work in progress. I've still not published that, but <laughs> you, see, you see how it goes. It's so hard to get these things out, isn't it? And then, so I was there for five or six months. And then following that, I started a postdoc fellowship at the University of Potsdam in Germany. So I then hopped back across to Europe. Um, and I was there for about two years where I was kind of exploring links between data science and geomorphology. So trying to kind of do an interdisciplinary thing. But I guess I always kind of knew I wanted to stay in academia, but also that being in the UK was really important to me. So I started to apply for permanent jobs. And then I was really lucky to get my job at Durham University, which I started in June 2019. Um, yeah, and I, I really like my job because it's a mixture of research and teaching. Um, I think it's a good balance, although I guess online teaching has been challenging this year. Um, but I'm happy to take any questions about, you know, applying for those permanent jobs or, or applying for postdocs um, or kind of moving to different countries and the challenges involved in that, because I think that's something that's hard to kind of balance the, the personal and professional side of, of your career. So yeah, that's where it all for me, I think for now. Thank you so much, Fiona. No, that, that's really brilliant. And I, I can imagine that a lot of our attendees will definitely have questions, definitely probably about the grants, but also about the kind of international side of, of postdocing, because yeah, there's a lot of moving and transitioning. So it would be great to get your, hear your insight on that. So thank you. Uh, so we'll move next to uh, Safa. So if you want to introduce yourself, please. Hi again, and thanks again for inviting me to the webinar. And uh, it's really great opportunity to talk about this and like hearing from others as well. Um, I'm originally from Syria. I came here like, um, let's see, nearly nine years ago uh, to do my postgraduate study. So I had my undergraduate from Damascus University and I came here to do my um, master and PhD. Uh, I did my MPhil in fluvial geomorphology, and then I carried my. I did the same <laughs> subject for my PhD. Um, both it was like my MPhil and my PhD was looking at controls on morphological changes uh, within river, even like in response to floods or um, um, over decadal um, time scale and sedimentary architecture. Um, Actually, to be honest, coming from like different 
totally different background and a different education system. I had a great opportunity during my um, doing my post uh, graduate study, like uh, gaining lots of experience doing field work and learning, like using many many um, different like surveying equipment. And uh, to be honest. My current job as a physical geography technician in uh, Newcastle University, uh, it's the first job I applied for. Uh, I applied for this job before I finished my PhD because I thought like, I was thinking like, I, I did gain a great experience in doing field work and learning lo lots of things and using uh, LiDAR data, JS, uh, many soft different softwares and uh, and it's the ground penetrating radar as well. So I thought like, but when I used to go to the, um, to the lab to do my sediment analysis, it's so like, I don't know, or I have any idea about these instruments. So um, this job came and I thought like, if I apply to this job, it's gonna be like a, another opportunity for me to gain more and more and uh, learn new skills. Um, I, I got, I started my current job just after two days finishing of submission, uh, submitting my uh, thesis. So it was so quick. Uh, it was just short team contract, but then uh, they offered me if I want permanent. And to be honest, I'm happy with it because it's been uh, nearly like a year and a half for me and I'm learning every day something new. So yeah, that's it. <laughs> Sounds absolutely fantastic. And I guess everyone who does a PhD tends to absolutely love learning. I know that I'm the same. I, I love just learning new things and continue to develop. So it just sounds fantastic. And it's always great to hear from someone else who's done an MPhil because very few people have. <laughs> so I know some. Yeah. So that's fantastic. Thank you. Uh, we'll move over to Andy now. So Andy, if, can you introduce Hi. Yeah, uh, thanks very much. And thank you very much uh, for having me. Um, yeah, so it's really nice to sort of get involved with these sorts of things every now and again. Um, although I do apologise for my lockdown hair. Um, yeah, so I, I guess a little bit about myself. I, um, I did my undergraduate degree at Aberystwyth in physical geography. And then um, it was there that I realised that I um, had a thing for glaciers that I hadn't really appreciated before, um, before you know, doing my undergraduate. So I, um, I worked, uh, finished my degree, um, did a couple of years um, for a utility company working in GIS. Um, and a few bits and, other, and bobs before um, getting the PhD um, opportunity at, at Newcastle. So um, yeah, so that's where I, I did, uh, worked with um, Professor Andy Russell for more years than I think um, either of us would like to admit. Um, there's a lesson there around not starting a real job before you finish your PhD, but we can, we can move on to that. Um, and then, yeah, I, um, towards the end of my PhD, I, um, I joined an engineering consultancy firm. Um, it was something that I'd never even knew existed. Didn't know that people would pay you to, to do that sort of stuff. Um, but um, I'd met a few people that had worked in similar firms and kind of I needed a job. You know, I, um, I, I'd gone into academia with the intention of being a lecturer and sort of you know, following in the footsteps of those people that inspired me during my undergrad. And I very quickly learned that I I'm not an academic, um, but um, there are a whole series of other skills that I, you know, picked up um, during my PhD. Um, you know, and uh, yeah, now working consultancy, work on uh, large scale infrastructure projects around the world, um, doing doing the sort of stuff that Matilda was was talking about at the beginning. Um, so quite often, um, I work with people at the Environment Agency and other um, local authorities to. Uh, help my clients develop projects in a way that um, you know meets all of the necessary legal requirements, but also doesn't um, doesn't damage the planet at the same time. You know, and um, my the, the important thing for me is to you know is to make sure that our clients don't screw things up. It's basically um, <laughs> the nicest way of putting it. Really, um, you know. The, there's always a balance and it's about um, making sure that the balance is tipped in the right direction for me. But we, we, can, we can get into the details later. Yeah, that sounds absolutely brilliant. And yeah, it's uh, definitely a very important job. You're making sure your clients don't cause more damage than there is already around in the world. Yeah, yeah. absolutely, yeah. yeah. 
<laughs> that sounds brilliant, Andy. And I'm sure a lot of our um, members will have some questions for you as well about uh, kind of that transitioning from academia to industry and the kind of uh, the arguments that go around in your head when you're making that decision. So thank you. Well, and then finally, uh, last but definitely not least, uh, we'll hear from Val, please. So please go ahead and introduce yourself. Hello. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, so I came to geomorphology fairly late. It wasn't really in my PhD that I started to do some geomorphology work. And I couldn't really call myself a geomorphologist until I did a postdoc uh, because I did all my background, my, my earlier degrees uh, back in the States in biology and marine biology. But my interests were very much in the interactions between physical processes and ecosystem processes. So that, that, that was my link to jump over into fluid geomorphology because you know, water flow and sediment really structures everything in a river. Uh, though, so I came here not to study, I came here for love. The, we all had different reasons for traveling and then I had to find something that worked for me. I really wanted my PhD to be in uh, marine biology, but it didn't work. So I took the one at Queen Mary and I had, it was probably the best decision I've ever had. Uh, I worked with great people. Um, unfortunately, I finished my PhD in the middle of well, in 2010, which was a terrible time to get a job. Um, I couldn't find a job for a year, then got a job at a consultancy and had to quit a few months later because for family reasons. Uh, and then I thought I was completely out of academia because of uh, a, a several year um, out. But I was lucky enough to get a position uh, postdoc uh, with Angela Grinnell which then led to um, you know, a good project, uh, which was a, an EU project, and then a position at Cranfield. So it, it was, I had taken a lot of time off over the, over the course of my career, and every point, I always thought my research career was dead. But it seemed to, just by you know, good timing and perhaps uh, you know, slowly building a CV, I was able to get the job. And Cranfield is, is probably a place you've never really known about. Uh, we're not an undergraduate institution. We're not on the league tables. Really, we're kind of a niche research uh, intensive organization. Um, and there's a lot of pressure to get to win money. And it was quite scary when I started. Uh, I felt like a bit like I was back in consultancy again. Um, but it's been really good for me. It's good to be pushed out of your comfort zone, apply for slightly, things are slightly lateral, and you never know what you'll, you'll get. So. Uh, happy to talk about that journey. I also sit on interview panels quite often for lecturer and postdoc positions. Uh, I have two UKRI grants at the moment that I'm PI on, so I have hired postdocs for that as well. Um, so I'm used to developing those briefs and, and trying to uh, get the right, right uh, postdoc. That all sounds absolutely brilliant and some, I'm sure, very, very helpful advice to all of our attendees um, who are looking for jobs. And thank you as well for talking about setbacks and actually when you applied for jobs during the financial crisis, because I know that that is really weighing on the minds of people graduating now. Even people who are just starting their PhDs are really aware of actually what the job market is going to be like. And, and with all of these UKRI changes to their international and overseas policies with research, it is such a difficult time in, in research. So uh, it will give, I'm sure, a lot of confidence and maybe easy anxieties of some of our attendees to hear that actually, do you know what? the world is a has always been a tricky place for recruitment and it just it's it's it rises and falls um all the time so again hearing your thoughts on that will be really really valuable so thank you okay then so um that's all of our panel members introduced um so for our attendees our non-panel member attendees um we've got a, a few ways um for you to uh, ask questions to our panel members so you can either um, write them out in the chat, you can either send them publicly to everyone or privately to either myself, Erin or Ollie, we're, or Oliver even, uh, we're happy to uh, field those questions if you want to do it more anonymously. Um, and then uh, you can also use the raise hand function on Zoom as well. So uh, we do want it, uh, to hear from you all, we want this to kind of be driven by what you want to hear from our panel members and what um, you want to kind of get the most out of this session. So please, please do um, send as many questions questions in as you can um, and as you want to. Um, but I will hand back over now to Erin and Oliver. Thanks Oli. I've, um, I've um, stopped sharing screen so you can all um, see the panellists now. Um, also in the background we're going to do a poll, I should have said this before but I forgot, um, just to find out what type of geomorphology everyone's interested in, um, mainly because we're interested but also we thought we could do the breakout rooms by themes, um, unless everyone's like fluvial geomorphology then we'll just have random breakout rooms. 
Um, but I think you should be able to like minimize that. Now I've launched it, um, so it shouldn't interfere. <laughs> um, yeah, so Ollie, do you want to start with the question? Uh, yep. Yeah, I'm happy to start. Uh, we, we've uh, prepared a couple of questions uh, to get the ball rolling. Um, so the first question is really building kind of um, what uh, Bob was just talking about. You know, um, many people who are starting uh, looking for jobs right now um, are only hearing bad news. So I was kind of wondering, you know, how people have dealt with this in the past and whether they have any kind of suggestions or insights into, you know, perhaps looking into uh, areas that you wouldn't necessarily have looked into uh, before. Um, yeah, anyone, anyone who's willing to jump in? I can jump in. Yep, um, I, I'm aware that I've been extremely lucky in my career path. I handed in my PhD and applied for a job the same day because they just happened to be available but um something I am noticing at the moment is that I, I find that all the consultancies that I'm working with seem to be really struggling to recruit which I find really interesting because I don't know whether Andy could <laughs> shed more light on this but all the consultancies we work with they they're really struggling to find people like um new geomorphologists to recruit I guess it's because they might be area specific like I know particularly up north they're struggling to find some um so I so I so I wouldn't say necessarily believe the rumors I would say like I don't know Andy if, if there's a specific yeah, site where you I'm, 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 I'm happy to jump in <laughs> I mean yeah. I'm not, not that I'm Please able me. to offer everybody on the on the call a job um but um no I I I would say that in the last year, um, I have been busier than I've ever been. And um, now I, I uh, like Bob, I started my career um, in, well, late 2008 and within a year was going through a redundancy process and it was you know, pretty, pretty difficult. Um, and I think that then um, when I look back at the last year and yes, lots of, lots of people have been very badly affected. Um, but a lot of money is still being spent. So, you know, in the work that I, you know, the work where I work, um, clients are still wanting to develop, things are still moving forward. And um, we're constantly looking for, for good people. I think that possibly the difficulty is, is that, well, I know that it was definitely the case when I was doing my PhD is that I didn't know that my job existed. Um, I would just a, you know, a, a freak conversation I think in the pub in Newcastle um, and I, somebody told me that I could be paid to, to do this sort of stuff um, so we probably just don't get the right sorts of, of candidates because they don't know that it's the sort of thing that you can do um, and especially I, mean, I guess a lot of people if, you, if you're doing a PhD you probably want to be going into that academic background you know but you know sort of not background then um, you know future looking forward um, so it might be considered a, you know, if you don't do, if you, if you if you don't meet that goal, then you look at consultancy. I was the other way around. I really, I'd come to the conclusion that I didn't want to be an academic, but then didn't know what to do, and then found this, and actually, it's something that has has um has really sort of been very good for me. Um, so yeah, I I, I think I would agree. Don't believe the the horror stories quite mm -hmm. so much. Um, you, you know, just having a PhD, um, it helps. You know, you've obviously shown that you can, that you're committed, that you can, you know, step up, you know, a step above, you know, the, the people that have only done a master's as if it's, on, you know, as if that's not, um, you know, a great achievement in itself. Um, so, you know, it, I would try and take a look at the positives, but feel free to reach out um, on LinkedIn, you know, take advantage of those sorts of um, networks and um, just be, I guess, be open-minded really. That, that you will you won't do things as um, quite in as much detail as you do for your PhD, but you'll have a, possibly have a lot more variety. So, um, yeah, I, I, I just like to add to that as well from the 
I guess if we're looking from the environment agency perspective as well. So there's 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 public sector, or depending where you live, perhaps uh, CEPA or NRW, but there's also so many rivers, river charities, rivers trusts, um, so many councils that all have their own departments for, for example, if, you, if say if you're a coastal or a river geomorphologist, there are so many de like small departments that you might not know about that spend all day doing river restoration and trying to find grants to work with partners to do a big catchment rewilding project, for example. It's just about knowing where you can find those jobs. So I think, um, for example, I've just become chair of the Professional Geomorphology Committee for the BSG. And I'm really passionate about that committee because when I was in the BSG uh, doing my PhD, so many acronyms, um, I honestly didn't know anything existed outside of academia. Like Andy said, like I, I really didn't know there were other jobs and I had completely lost faith because there, there were no academic jobs to do. Um, so I think having, a new, having this community to be able to ask, where do I look for a job? Who can I ask? It's so important. It's a good way of networking. So, you know, I'm happy to put my email out there if anyone, if anyone's looking for a job and they need help finding one, this is the kind of place where it's good to discuss it. Everybody has a different path. It really depends on your interests. Mm. You know, some people are so passionate about research, they'll go from postdoc to postdoc and they'll travel anywhere in the world. Other people are limited because of personal reasons or how far they can go. Um, and others are so determined to be an academic that they'll, they'll find other routes in. I know countless people who've done a nine month or a one year long uh, lecture position or teaching fellowship, which has then got extended and extended and then converted into a full-time position. So don't view any of that, that interim job, that first job you get as the end all. You know, you can still progress in many different directions after that, and you can switch to consultancy or an environment agency and then come back again because those skill sets are highly valued across. Um, and I, I run quite a lot of workshops for people for the, um, uh, the biodiversity net gain uh, river condition assessment, which is uh, something that huge amount of work is being done in consultancy for. Um, and there are people going out there doing river-based surveys everywhere on the world or on the UK or on England because of development work. Um, and the loads of people who are just finished their masters and just finished their PhDs who've gotten jobs at consultancies. Okay. Yeah, can uh, can I just add one thing maybe about postdoc opportunities? I think the, the opportunities that I received were, were kind of mostly from networking with people at conferences and then people would say like, oh, there's this great source of funding, maybe you could put in an application to that. And so I think if if you're struggling to find stuff, I would say like reach out to people that you're really excited to work with and you never kind of know what opportunities can arise. So I think for me, that was like a really, really useful thing to do. And I think one thing to say is, is I, I thought, well, I wanted to go back into academia and and only after, after sort of whatever, 10, 10 interviews and not getting the first spot, you, you gradually sort of think, oh, well, I, I slip into something else. And then something else was actually a lot better. Talking then to people that, that were staying in academia, I thought eventually, well, actually, I wouldn't have liked that. And, and three years ago, I, I jumped in and, and, and taught uh, sort of a, a third year coastal course at university. And I hated it. It was absolutely because Obviously, to, being a PhD student, or even better, being a postdoc. I mean, this is this is the life of Riley. I mean, you're doing whatever you want, uh, and 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 no responsibility in the world. And becoming an academic as a lecturer is completely different. Um, the, 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 you you basically organize the grants for other people to have fun. Um, so I, I, th I think I think there, there is other things. Um, obviously, with, with fluvial geomorphology, yeah, there's there's loads in the UK. I mean, although there's not really big rivers, I've, I always find sort of little ditches. But but there's lots of things that we can do there. Um, and there's a question in the chat in, in in terms of sort of the narrowness of some some PhD uh, jobs and, and and topics and so on. I think one of the most important things is you do need to look at well, what can I do, and then what 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 don't I know? So um, when, when I did a PhD, there, there wasn't actually GIS really around, but, but 
But I thought, well, GIS is the thing that you need to do. And so you 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 explore that and and and, and you 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 skill yourself up. And that's probably the thing that should probably start even with doing the PhD. You, you think, well, this these are the skills I employ here, but what other skills are probably out there? And most of them are, are somewhat numerical, I would have thought. Uh, yeah, Thanks. yeah, um, yeah. Does anyone want to um, expand on the question in the chat? So you know, uh, further on from you know, a lot of you know, you you do an incredibly specific uh, topic as your PhD, and then particularly if you're looking for postdocs, they're looking for very specific things as well. It seems like um, so it can be quite difficult to, you know, if you're not um, the most confident person, you know, you might be put off by, um, you may feel like um, you're unable to apply for positions uh, because they're not within your um, your wheelhouse. How, how would you, um, you know, go about applying for those uh, different positions, which you, you may not be um, the most suitable for? I'll, um, I'll, I'll jump in um, if nobody else wants to. Um, <clears throat> I think that one of the, Oh, in my experience, uh, one of the, the the hardest things about doing a PhD is that it it's um, you concentrate, you know, you focus so much on something so specific that you um, you kind of you don't realize that everything you don't realize all of the other stuff that you're learning and that you you're picking up all those skills along the way because you're concentrating on this this one problem, um, and it's. And I, I recognize that you know, it's only in the last you know, five or six years, really. So, so you know, so six, seven years after finishing that I realized that actually there are loads of skills that I picked up during my PhD that um, I have really um, helped me out along the way. And I think that it, it kind of goes back to what you're saying, Oliver, about confidence. Um, you've done a PhD, you know, you know, that's amazing. You know, you've, um, so you've already, you know, demonstrated that you've got all of these skills, but don't, I, I, my, I guess my advice would be don't concentrate on the, you know, the roundness indices of that specific, ge you know, um, type of uh, geology in the specific river basin, blah, 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 whatever it may be. Concentrate on the ability to write, the ability to use GIS, the ability to interpret data as a scientist, not as a geomorphologist. Um, you know, and then if you think about it in those terms, you've picked up loads of skills that um, are, can be applied in all sorts of different fields. Um, you know, and I, I have the confidence to recognise that and to say, yeah, I, there are some things that I don't know, but well, I've done a PhD, so I've demonstrated that I'm capable of learning. So um, give it, give, give me a shot. You know, I think that that's the sort of person that people, that um, recruiters are looking for, those sorts of people that are able to understand where they are and um, apply those skills. You know, they're not, there's never going to be a position that is exactly for you as a PhD, as coming out with a PhD, because nobody else has done that work other than you. So you've kind of, painted yourself into a corner really um if you if you think about it in those terms so try not to think about it in those terms and think about it in terms of all of the other good stuff that you've done and the you know the thesis on the shelf you know become is the cherry on the top i mean <laughs> we spend so much time worrying about the thesis my wife now uses it as a mouse map well, um, andy makes a good point there's no postdoc would ever completely match uh, your skill set. And we know that when we're, when we're trying to find the postdoc, we're recruiting a position, we, we're trying to find the person who has the skill sets that are closest to what we need. Um, and the things that weigh very strongly, though, are a demonstrated of independence in thought, in work, and demonstration of publishing. Really, I mean, to get a, a postdoc position, you really need to have papers submitted before you're applying, ideally papers accepted as well. Uh, so that's something that if your supervisors are not pushing at this early stage, you should yourself. You should aim to have things submitted before the end of your second year or early in your second year, at least one paper, a methods paper uh, or a critical review. Uh, 
um, because you really need to have that published track record for a postdoc. But you don't need a postdoc to get an academic career because that's what I said earlier. You know, you can. There's another route. There's the teaching route uh, at a lot of universities. Um, so don't don't worry. If that friend of mine who got a position, a full time position, she had never had a postdoc. She didn't have her papers published until after she was done. But she got in. Um, and another friend they went that way too. So let's, just don't don't uh, beat yourself up if you're not getting the papers out. I was, I was going to say, actually, just going off that question, are postdocs compulsory to get a job in academia? Well, uh, Safa, one of our wonderful panel members, is is, uh, is a great case study of that. I don't know if you want to um, share a bit about your experiences there. Yes, sure, yes. Uh, actually, to be honest, and, um, as Bob said, because um, I didn't have any paper, uh, and I had many examples in front of me of my colleagues saying, like, we are going to stuck in academia, lecturing or a postdoc and then staying for at least like one, two years without any job. Uh, in my last year, I started thinking about, I had to think about different paths. And like, um, I started looking at the environmental agency um, and um, uh, start looking at in the, in industry because I have the skills in JS and in geophysics as well. So um, in my last year, I started looking for different paths because lecturing, it wasn't an option for me at all. Um, the, the only option was like to start in academia is doing like a postdoc, but still like for me, I feel like it's not that security in job. It's always linked to research council grants. You have to always apply if you got it, you, are, you had the job and it might be just like 10 months or maximum sometimes three years. So I didn't want just to stay after finishing my PhD, just looking for a job, applying for money and got, get rejection. So I started thinking about alternatives. I've got an offer from environment agency to work uh, with, but was, uh, the job was in Leeds due to like, um, because I have a young family, it was like not an option as well for me. So um, this post as a lab technician came in the university as a maternity governor. So I thought if I applied, um, I know that I'm gonna uh, still have, get more uh, skills and new skills and uh, I'll, I'll be in the forefront of the research as well. I'll still close, uh, working closely to the staff and the student as well. Um, teaching in labs, um, I will have many opportunities to do trainings and uh, yeah, so I, I applied for the job and I was lucky to be honest because I've got it and I started just two days after I, f I finished my PhD. Um, and the first, like I had, I had the whole idea about equipments and things related to field work, nothing related to the uh, lab, but now after a year I can say like, I did many trainings and I know like my experience, like I, I developed border, um, border subject experience. So um, new skills and new approach, at least like um, I'm not staying at home, <laughs> especially in this, in, in, under the current circumstances and you know, the job market now. Um, so yeah, and I'm still uh, thinking about like um, writing my paper. So in future, if I want to, to convert, maybe I'll have the opportunity, so. Thanks, Safa. That's really interesting. It's nice to hear like another entrance to academia as well. It's not one I thought of, but sounds really great. Um, we've had another question in the chat, um, which is for Fiona and Bob. Um, so Fiona, do you want to go first? It um, says, as a recently appointed postdoc who would like a career in academia, what are the key things you would say um, that would help you to be a competitive applicant um, for a permanent lectureship? So are like publications most important things or are there other important qualities? Yeah, thanks Erin. That's a good question. Um, so I can give an attempt at an answer and then I'm sure Bob can, can join in. Um, so I think for me, the most important things were, as Bob said, having publications. So I think that was really important, like showing that you can publish stuff from your, from your PhD and, you know, from postdocs if you have them. Um, so I had also done a NERC Knowledge Exchange Fellowship in my PhD, which is a kind of six month internship where I worked actually at SEPA, so the Scottish Environmental Protection Agency. But I think that helped a lot because it was, you could put it on your CV as a kind of PI on a, a NERC grant. 
Um, and despite the fact it was, wasn't too much work to actually get the funding, you know, but I think doing stuff like that, that can show that you've got the ability to kind of gain some funding yourself um, and that you've got, you know, like ability to go and get research projects started, I think really helped. So I'd encourage you all to, yeah, apply for different grants, even if it's just for field work or for going to conferences, things like that. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. I think also collegiality, so showing that you will be a good fit to the department and that you're willing to kind of like you're a good team player and you're going to work with everyone because the people that are in the department want to work with you as well. So kind of demonstrating that somewhere, I think is also good. Yeah, I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Bob. No, I think you are quite good there with the you know, it's published show that you have initiative and you want to get, uh, you're trying to get grants and even little little successes are still important at an early stage. Um, and I think one other thing I would add is that, you know, whilst we tend to focus on the outputs and the money you want and the publications you've gotten, um, showing that you're willing to teach is really important. And that many of us, and in the US it's a different system. So we, you essentially do your PhDs part-time and then you spend the other half of your time doing an, uh, uh, you're teaching or doing a research project for your supervisor. Um, so you get a lot of teaching experience there. But in the UK, you don't, you don't get that unless you're in one of these rare teaching fellowships. Uh, so I would really recommend that you ask your supervisor or others, do you need someone to demonstrate on a lab? Do you need uh, someone to help you with a workshop? Sometimes they pay you, sometimes they don't. But you can fill a half a page or more of a CV with I demonstrated on this field trip and I did that and you can fluff that up. Um, and, it look, and then you can show that you taught in different year groups, year one, two, three, masters. You've done different types of things, lecturing, demonstrating, field assistance. You know, yeah, you have, to, you have to show that side of the, of the uh, academic profile as well. Uh, yeah, yeah, that was a very good answer, thank you. Um, uh, we've got a question here specifically for Andy in the chat, but um, maybe it will be applicable to more people as well. Um, as part of your job in consultancy, what are the differences slash skills slash advantages um, uh, do you see in your job uh, that your PhD is providing you compared to someone with a master's? So what are the differences between doing a master's and uh, applying versus uh, continuing um, in your academia to get a PhD? Um, um, it's really a difficult question. That um, I mean, I guess the first thing to say is that most of the people that I work with have a master's. We don't employ people that don't have a master's. Um, so um, the, I guess the biggest difference, is that I think there's a, probably a little bit of kudos around it. You know, I've had clients that have said to me they want me because of the letters behind my name. Um, so um, that not really um, relevant here, but um, I think really critical thinking. Having I think that having done a PhD, once you've got over the uh, initial shock of that, it, it's um, okay to to not know everything. Um, you've you've picked up a load of skills. I I, I go back to what I was saying earlier. Really, there are so many skills that. I have that I didn't even appreciate I had when I was writing my PhD and when I, when I was um, sort of starting out. And it's only now when I, you know, I, I'm now in the process of, you know, uh, recruiting people um, and working with people that are coming through, you know, 10 years later. And I realized that there's still, you know, academic institutions do a fantastic job. But there are still things that you don't pick up as an undergraduate or, or as a master's student because there's only so much time. The, there's a lot to be said for just being locked in a room for three years, having to work it all out for you, on your own, you know, be completely independently. I was being, I was being generous with three hours. I was there for a lot longer than three, don't worry. Um, so, you know, you'll, it's, it's, re it's really difficult um, to answer the question with any sort of like specifics because they're very intangible, but I assure you that if you've gone through a PhD um, you've picked up a load of stuff that you don't even realize will be, will, will be important. And then you'll realize that you can do something that the person next to you can't. And I, I, I probably have that experience 
twice a week. And I, especially with, and this is probably going to sound ageist, I apologise if it's politically incorrect. I always assume that people that are younger than me are going to be much better that with the technology and computers and all that sort of stuff. Um, I find that I'm, I'm way better at it because I was forced to teach myself how to use GIS. Um, you know, there was no you know, uh, lectures on, on that sort of stuff. There was, uh, I was forced to teach myself how to program in, uh, no, just simple stuff, macros and you know, uh, how to do like all the wizardry in just like the simple office packages. Most people don't know how to do that. Um, and those are the sorts of things that, you know, become really important. It's not the, the super scientific stuff in, in, in my part of the world. It's getting the job done efficiently and correctly and knowing how to write really well. Um, so I, I definitely do think there is an, an advantage. Sorry, I've rambled on and not really answered the question. Can I jump in as well <laughs> <laughs> at the end of your... Um, I, I just wanted to say it really does depend. The difference between the master's and the PhD from, from the way I've interpreted that is it depends whether what kind of master's it was, whether it was a research master's or a taught one, because I think I'd say the difference is just experience in self-teaching basically because I think if you're doing a taught master's that is effectively another year of university just more specialized but if you're doing a research master's that's effectively like a one or two year PhD so I think what I learned in my research master's and my PhD is how to teach myself and having to go go out and learn for example like you said go out and learn GIS go out and learn how to I had to learn statistics because I hated maths at school and I just had to teach myself maths and stuff like that. Um, so I think there's a big difference. And I just wanted to say as well that um, for the geomorphologists in the EA, I'd say it's kind of 50-50, those who only have a master's and those who have a master's and a PhD. And the only real difference between us is what level you start at. So for example, if you've already got a PhD, you might be a bit more confident and have a bit more experience from the offset. Whereas if you start with a master's, you're a bit more fresh and you just need to have a few more years of learning before you become um more confident in your job basically and i'd say that's i'd say experience is the main difference uh, yeah there's a question that uh, builds on that quite nicely in the chat is asking about how how to value yourself uh, when you're looking for these jobs in the corporate world you know you don't have you know not necessarily have uh, very much work experience but you have lots of the skills. So it's kind of, you know, what, what sort of um, level should you be aiming at? You know, not very, not very many jobs will ask specifically for a PhD. So what sort of level should you be um, kind of aiming for um, when you're looking at um, more applied jobs rather than academia? I mean, I mean, ideally you obviously want to aim as high as possible. Um, at the Environment Agency, we, we had, um, in, in, in flood modeling and forecasting teams, sort of people who did PhDs and, and did build hydrodynamic models sort of really detailed, they, they, they knew their stuff. And, and they basically got in in very low paid jobs. And, and so, so a PhD is not necessarily a guarantee that you get a high paid one. Um, but, but I think you, you just start with whatever you can get hold of. And, and once you have a job, then you look for others. I mean, that's, that's the thing. It's, it's not, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say, well, oh, this is, this is sort of only 20,000 or so. I wouldn't go for that. Well, um, hey, you never know. Is it a large organization? Then you might quite quickly get, find, find internally lots of other jobs and so on. So, um, but I, I, I would have thought someone fresh with a PhD, salary band wise, this, this doesn't give you a, an awful lot of edge because you, you still need to be sort of trained on the job. Uh, it's the experience that gets you the salary band that fire. Yeah. Um, oh, no, you go, go ahead. Oh, sorry, I was going to say, I, I would. I would agree with that. I think the only thing that I would probably add is that I think that you probably you probably come in at a similar a similar salary band to somebody with a master's, but it's that um, 
uh, as uh, Matthew was saying, that the, um, you know, the confidence in having and the experience, you might find that you go through the rank slightly quicker because you'll, you'll be able to demonstrate uh, these skills that, you know, you already have rather than having to learn them. Yeah, I think um, that is something I've actually really struggled with. Um, is that if you're going into, first of all, if you're going into the environment sector, which if you're going into applied geomorphology more or less is, and if you're going into the public sector as well, you can't really, you can't really expect to be paid big money in general. Like you're not going to be rich. You do it because you love, you love geomorphology. And I think you've always got to keep that in the back of your mind. I think um you mentioned corporate world so if you if you were thinking perhaps using your phd skills to do a completely different type of job i'm not sure if that's what you meant or whether you meant going into geomorphology in the applied world but i think obviously yeah from from the public sector point of view or general environment jobs you've got to take what you can get and not expect to be rich but perhaps comfortable i don't know how how like not quite sure what you were asking but I think I think that's something to bear in mind I think that's already helpful advice um <laughs> if you have any more questions to add to it Josh just put in the chat um I was just wondering in terms of um academia how short-term contracts how like how adapt how hard it is to adapt between different short-term contracts and I guess moving from different countries it seems to be quite a large factor of finding postdocs at the moment um so Fiona, I guess I was wondering what your experience was with that. Yeah, I find that pretty challenging. And I think it's maybe this thing that everyone's familiar with where you're always like one step behind. So you're always working on stuff from the last job while you're trying to also do the new job. Um, so that's something that I'm not sure I've still been able to deal with, but I think it's just recognizing that everybody is in that same boat and everybody's catching up um, and to give yourself a bit of slack for that. Um, in terms of the moving countries thing, I think I, I'm not actually sure whether it's necessary. I guess that there's, there's a school of thought, isn't there, that, you know, if you go abroad and you work in all these different places that you're somehow more competitive for a job. I think you do gain a breadth of experience just with working with different people and you see how different people think how they do research is very different depending on the person. But I, I, I don't like to subscribe to the thing, I guess, where you have to sacrifice everything in your personal life for the job because I don't think it's worth it. I think you, you need to kind of decide for yourself what's the balance to get there, but put your kind of personal life first, I would say. I like that advice. <laughs> um, does anyone have anything else to add? I guess, um, Safa, you must have and it different moving um, to your postgraduate degree? How did you find um, the transition? Yeah, actually, uh, for me, I find like, I, because I came, as I said, from different like background, uh, had no experience at all, not even in field work. Um, I struggled in the first, but as uh, Andy said, and Matilda, like I start learning new skills, struggled at the first learning JS or doing like, um, uh, uh, using the lab to do my sediment samples because I was learning everything from scratch. So, um, but I was open to my supervisor and I've got uh, lots of support from them, to be honest, because they always try to uh, build my CV with me, like encourage me to do more and more. Um, even if I, for, for a minute, like if I remember in, in my middle of my PhD, my supervisor asked me to, to start thinking about the geophysics using ground penetrating radar. And I was like, no, no way. I can't start learning now this new skills. It's like, I have no idea about it. But he said like, you learned so much so far and you are capable to do it. So, and yeah, I remember I, I applied for a fund uh, from the New York to get the uh, ground penetrating radar. So it took a few months at, uh, until I got uh, approval to use the, uh, the equipment and things like that. And then it took like another six months to learn the uh, using the softwares to, to analyze my, my data. But, um, but because I was open to my supervisor saying like, 
lecturing is not an option for me and I want uh, to find the job at least after I finish. They always support me to, uh, to do teaching assistant to, uh, um, as Bob said, like I always help my supervisor attending like uh, their lecturing, uh, their field work. So I, I gained lots of skills and yeah, after like a year struggling with the geophysics, uh, like uh, data, I, I ended up with like a really good like uh, thesis. And um, so I, I knew like, you are capable, always capable to learn new things. And um, because my, my study area in, um, it was in River Cooket, so I, there was no opportunity to do like, because triple SI, uh, to do any coding. So um, now in my new um, uh, job, I start analyzing, uh, helping staff to analyze their samples, their coring sediment, and I'm planning after um, the restriction, <laughs> uh, after they left out the restriction to go out with staff even to learn how to, to get coring from the fill. So now I'm, but I'm helping now them analyzing uh, the, sam the samples in the lab. So it's always there are um, opportunity to learn more and to, yeah, <laughs> to, to get new skills and develop your career in a different way. <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, those are um, super helpful, um, some super helpful advice there. Uh, we just got um, two more questions in the chat and then we'll begin to wrap up, uh, wrap up the panel. So, um, We've got a question that's just asking uh, generally, you know, uh, what sorts of jobs do people do uh, with their fluvial geomorphology background uh, now that they're in uh, consulting? So I guess give like a rough um, idea of kind of the projects that, that you're currently working on. Shall I go with that one? <laughs> Any, as I think as, as Maria was saying earlier, you know, um, any project that needs to um, do anything to a river um, is likely to require a watch framework directive compliant assessment of some sort. So um, I've uh, spent some of years working on a, a large railway project that's one or two people may, may, have, may not have heard of. Um, every single watercourse that that railway line crosses has to be visited, um, documented, mapped, um, uh, has to, you know, a, a be uh, an understanding of its current condition has to be uh, recorded so that a um, an assessment of the potential impact of that future development can be um, can be properly understood. Um, but I also work on projects for um, uh, mining companies to make sure that they don't screw up all the rivers um, in the catchments in which they work, uh, not so much in the UK. Um, uh, power stations require um, abstractions and discharges um, to water courses. So again, anything that's going to take water out of a system or put, put it back in, we need to worry about the, uh, the physical and chemical states of those. Um, of those. Um, anything that you can think of um, related to building something uh, near water will require somebody that has an understanding of fluvial geomorphology. You went, yeah, you went down a different route to what I thought you, yeah. So there's those jobs, but there's also the, um, the more, I, in my opinion, the more fun side of things where you can literally redesign a river. So I, I work in London and Hertfordshire. So most of my rivers are either really low energy chalk streams or disgusting concrete drainage channels <laughs> so we do it we do a lot of really fun projects where either if you're a consultant or from my side my team reviewing the consultants designs you literally design the river use the flood maps use the topography and you can literally have a play around and you can you can do stage zero on a river you can just realign it you can put the meanders in um you can even be kind of the designer and the and the contractor so there are lots of small there are lots of small environmental consultancies that are coming out now for example like 
uh, five rivers and aqua maintain are two examples I can think of or maybe Seabeck I don't know if you've heard of these but they they literally design a river and then they'll use their contractors to build it and it's it's really fun seeing it go from start to finish so small jobs like that if you're a fluvial geomorphologist and you're a massive river geek then that's quite satisfying yeah I can't yeah. think of any more examples right now, but <laughs> actually, actually, sorry, just to say that if we're going on about the geomorphology roles, but actually within the EA, there are so many, so many different jobs that if you fancy to change, for example, in like um, in flood risk or in fisheries or hydrometry and telemetry, like there's so many different kind of roles that if you if you want to do something different, but you want the nine to five life in the public sector, then there's so many opportunities. And it's all river, it's all river geeks that we work with. So it's I, I just, and, I, and coastal, sorry. Yeah. I have no coast in my area, so I forget it a lot. I would just say that um, when applying for jobs, I know it's really, um, you know, you really concentrate on what you've spent the last three, four or five years of your life working on. Um, everybody, you are scientists. Market yourself as a scientist, right? You know, you're able to apply science um, that opens up a whole, like as uh, you know, as Matilda was saying, then you know, it opens up a whole different range of different things. I've done everything from hydraulic modelling of rivers to impacts on impact assessments on glaciers in in South America to uh, you know mines in Africa. Um, very little of it, only parts of it, were to do with geomorphology. The majority of it was just good science. That's just to emphasize that point is that it's really rare to find a job that says geomorphologist wanted. Usually they want, you know, a scientist uh, or they want a, or a, not even a river scientist, they're just looking for a consultant. Uh, and I think you need to be able to demonstrate you have the flexibility to do things. So you might not think you know much about contaminants, but actually if you've been studying fine sediment transport, you already have a pretty good understanding of where sediment bound contaminants will be going. Um, so you can build up that understanding and pitch yourself towards more water quality roles. Mm -hmm. Or as uh, Maddie said, you can very easily go towards hydrometry if you did a lot of work uh, with, you know, all level loggers and, and everything else. You, you can really pitch yourself in different directions based on those skills you obtained from your PhD. But also following on from that is what's really exciting. Sort of in the last few years, it's like the birth of the geomorphology job. Like there are, there are more and more jobs being advertised for geomorphologists, but I agree that it's quite rare. <laughs> but it, I think it's becoming more common. People are starting to realize what it, what, what it is because I hadn't even heard of it till I'd started my PhD and I'd been in physical geography for four years before that. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I guess um, there's just a final question in the chat before we uh, wrap up. Um, it's just talking about, you know, the potential that you might start down one route doing postdocs and then uh, might have to swap in to consultancy uh, for any any number of reasons and then you might also want to swap back you know do are those two how um compatible are those two experiences of postdocs uh, and consultancy and consultancy back to um, academia um i guess uh, ua you're your experience seems most, um, you seem to have plenty of experience in that. I think, I think fundamentally, I mean, that harks back to the, how, how are you valued? The more you swap between sectors, the, the, the higher you get on the pay grade. Uh, it, it's quite difficult to, to, to sort of advance within a certain company usually. It's, it's, it's a lot easier to, to swap around and, um, and so I think, I think the more experience and, and obviously working in different environments is, is exactly that. The more experience you have, the more valuable you, you will be to, to the employer. So I, I think um, there, 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 there's no one way street. There, there, there's, there, there's back and forth. And, and that is, I would, I would have thought, always more beneficial than a one way street. The, um something to add is that I, th I, I think this is quite rare in the ge in geomorphology I find the community the academic and the applied and the postgrad I find the community is quite a tight-knit 
far reaching but small community. So if you whether you're in consultancy or academia or regulatory industry, you, you have a network and you can talk to people and you always know about jobs. Um, and you can always ask, say, if I if I need help, I can speak to my old supervisor or one of his friends. Like it's quite easy to exchange knowledge, I find, which is nice. Okay, um, so we'll just wrap up the last um, bit of the panel, just uh, really just by asking if there's, you know, one specific piece of advice, you know, you feel like you wanted to give, you haven't had, haven't had the opportunity to, or, you know, you want to sum up everything we've kind of discussed in, in, a, single, um, in a single line. Um, so I guess we'll start with uh, Safa. Uh, yes, you are still doing your PhD. Just think about always um, the opportunity to learn more and more, and um, to always be like open to your supervisor. Tell them what you want to learn and get the support from them. Uh, yeah, every like minor um, things you learn, it's gonna help. It's gonna be help for for finding a job. So yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm just going along my screen. So, Andy, you're you're on the next on the screen. Sorry, my smart, smart speaker just started talking to myself, talking to me. Um, if uh, two pieces of advice, I guess, um, if if you can, and it's not always possible, it wasn't for me. Finish your PhD before you get a real job. Sorry, uh, before you get a full time job, because. Um, no matter how hard you think it'll be to finish whilst working, it'll be harder. Um, or it was in my experience anyway. And uh, I guess the other one would be um, do a job that you really enjoy. You, you know, there, there are loads of jobs out there. Uh, you have to enjoy it because you'll be doing it for a long time. Um, and doing a job that makes you unhappy is definitely, you know, not a good idea you know walk out if you have to um i've done that um i wouldn't recommend it doing it all the time but um you know yeah be happy i guess that's my mental health awareness moment um yeah you know look after yourself uh, and do a job that you enjoy hey, uh, Fiona. yeah i think my advice would be um don't believe in the imposter syndrome so this is like, especially there's been research shown that um, women are often more overqualified for jobs, but they don't apply because they don't think their skills match the criteria. Um, so I would say just like have confidence in yourself and just go for it when you're applying for things because you never know what will happen. And I think, you know, you've got to be in it to win it. So yeah, just have some self-belief. <laughs> um, Bob? stay positive we all get job rejections always it's unlikely to be about you it's more likely that there is a slightly better fit for somebody else but it doesn't mean that you were not good enough for a job okay? and uh, take as many opportunities as you can find even if they think you might be a little bit lateral try it it'll add to the cv it'll add to your experiences you might find that you'll enjoy that more and you want to move in a different direction Um, Matty? Um, I would emphatically agree with Andy about doing a job you enjoy. Um, if, like me, at the, if you're sort of in your final writing up stage and you haven't opened your curtains or left your house for a month and you never want to do science ever again, which is kind of how I was feeling at the end of my PhD, please just bear in mind that there are so many jobs that you can do that aren't academic and you can always go back to it when you've had a break. So please use me and use the BSG and any of anyone else who wants to give their email to ask because I love talking about this stuff. So please just ask. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. And then last but not least, uh, Yui. I think as a geomorphologist, you, you're more interested than just in your little PhD topic in geomorphology in general. If, if, if you find landforms interesting and you want to know 
why they are there, how they develop into the future. And it doesn't really matter whether it's a river, it's a coast, it's a mountain. Um, and that is a transferable skill. And, and the last thing is, if you, if you don't end up in academia, you can still write papers. I mean, nobody is hindering you doing that. And, and I wrote the best of my papers during my two hour daily commute one way uh, to the consultancy company. That, that was the best part of my day, four hours sitting on a train on my laptop, going into it and writing it. If, if, you are, if you are a dedicated sort of PhD uh, geomorphologist, this is your hobby and, and you can do your hobby wherever you want. Great. Yeah, thank you uh, to all of our, our panelists. You know, I think that was um, a super useful and super helpful um, a talk we had. Um, you know, hopefully the, um, everyone who attended also found it useful. I know I did. Um, we're going to move on now to um, Holly's prepared a, um, a brief talk just um, to focus a lot more on um, how to, uh, you know, how to find those jobs when you want to apply for them and then the applying um, process itself. So thanks again to our, to our panelists. Yeah, thank you uh, for the introduction, Oliver. And I will say to our panelists, if you do need to go, please don't uh, feel like you have to stick around out of politeness to hear me chat about applying for jobs because you definitely don't need to. Though, please do stick around for, to find out what landform you are if you are interested in that. Okay, so I'm just gonna quickly share my screen. So just bear with me one second whilst I do that. And can everyone see that okay? Yeah, that's great. Perfect. Okay, wonderful. So uh, post PhD careers in geomorphology. So uh, there are my contact details. If you have any questions at all about uh, the information that I provide today, or just any questions in general, please don't hesitate to send me an email or send me a DM on Twitter. I'll also preface this with I have created four workbooks um, for the attendees of these sessions. So I've created two CV guides, one for um, CVs in um, industry and one in academia, and the same for cover letters. So hopefully those are gonna be literally a step-by-step -step process on exactly how you should be presenting yourself um, to an employer. So what I'm gonna be going over in the uh, presentation is more kind of broad strokes, and then hopefully those um, application uh, guidebooks will uh, help you with the more kind of technical stuff, which is a bit more boring to share over Zoom, I'm going to be honest. Uh, talking about structure and layout of a CV isn't the most interesting thing in the world. Um, so just very briefly as well, a little bit of background about me. I am currently doing my PhD, uh, but I've worked in careers and recruitment and employability for the past six years. So I've been doing that um, ever since the beginning of my undergrad. So I hope I know a thing or two about uh, careers, but um, please do correct me, any of our wonderful panel members, if you think I'm completely completely wrong. So um, first and foremost, what are your post PhD uh, career pathways? So also the um, industry members of our panel might hate me for this. I have grouped you together in just one hexagon, um, but there are a variety of different roles and um, pathways that you can take after your PhD, um, whether that's with advertised positions, uh, speculative applications, so reaching out to potential employers and seeing if there's a space for you in their um, company or uh, within academia. There's fellowship schemes, knowledge exchanges. Now I've put an asterisk next to these because the knowledge exchanges through um, the, the postdoctoral ones, not the internships that you would do during your um, uh, PhD, they are currently on hold um, because of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and the difficulties around funding. So there are still some available, but just keeping that in mind. Then there's obviously our non-research related roles in academia. So we've heard from Safa today, who is a, a phys job technician, but there's also things like grant coordinators, um, working in insurance, risk assessment, health and safety, things like that. And then there's finally the private, public and third sector industry. So you decided you wanna do a postdoc, um, whether that's in um, research or a focused postdoc or a, a teaching focused postdoc. So on the left, I've got kind of a typical application pathway that you would expect to be following. 
And on the right, I've got not necessarily a checklist, but just some things that you want to be aware of when you're applying for an advertised position. So first and foremost, thinking about what it is you've enjoyed most about your PhD experience. So not just the thesis, but the actual experience as a whole. So if you were able to do some teaching and demonstrating, you know, did you really enjoy helping to redesign certain aspects of modules? Did you enjoy um, simply just teaching undergrads and having that kind of on the ground um, real um, impact on undergraduates lives and their academic development? Or did you just enjoy you know, sitting in your lab or going on field work, doing your, um, your activities? It is important to have that kind of bit of self-reflection, really consider what it is that motivates you and what it is um, that you're interested in, because that really comes across in your applications. Uh, I have probably read oh, nearly 2000 cover letters, I would say probably more in my uh, past six years. And you can 100% tell when someone is just writing it for the sake of it, um, just because they need to send off X amount of um, applications in a week, or if they've genuinely got that interest in that job, in that research institution, in that department, things like that. So thinking about what you enjoy is really important. Then what will you bring to the table? So again, these things are important, not just for when, before you're applying, but when you're writing your application questions, preparing for your interview, preparing your covering letter. You know, what does the institution focus on? Is it grant success? Is it publications, ref and TEF scores? Of course, all institutions will look at all of these things, but some do have very clear priorities. So we heard from um, Bob earlier, who was talking about, you know, there's this huge amount of grant um, need within his institution, and it's highly competitive going forward about funding. So if you were applying to, you know, Cranfield University, you'd want to emphasize your um, grant and your economic successes in your project. So be aware of that constantly through the application process and not just when you're thinking about applying. And then, um, as the last question says, uh, last point says, uh, reach out to the nominated member of staff who is um, actually advertising the position. It shows interest. It shows familiarity with your name. So when they then read your application, they're like, oh, I remember Erin, she emailed me three weeks ago. We had a nice chat about fluvial geomorphology or debris flows. You know, it does that familiarity really does help a recruiter because when when you're recruiting and you're reading say 60 CVs for one position or for two positions anything that sticks out anything at all and hopefully a good thing um, really does help you get shortlisted so this next thing uh, so for, for this slide I've kind of focused on postdocs but it's actually all applicable for applying speculatively to jobs in industry as well obviously switching out PIs for managers or department heads so I think there's a statistic, something like 70% of um, jobs now are non-advertised. So 70% of jobs that you're going to be applying for, uh, well, sorry, the jobs that you are applying for online is only 30% of the actual jobs available. So within academia specifically, a lot of postdoc roles are funded by large grants. Some PIs will advertise these and apply for them themselves because they know that they've got a research project that they need a postdoc for. But do speculatively email potential supervisors and say, look, there is this grant upcoming. I've been following your work for the past 18 months and I really think we'd be a good fit. Here is my CV. Here is an idea of, of the kind of thing project we could do together. Would you be interested in submitting a proposal with me? Because doing that, it shows initiative, it shows drive, it shows out of the box thinking, and it may also secure you a job. Uh, I know for, for myself, I it's slightly different, but I applied for a three month fellowship in Canada and I completely out of the blue, just I'd been um, following um, Professor uh, Coppers, who is now my host supervisor over there um, for quite a few months. And I emailed her and I said, look, there's this scheme of 15,000 pounds for a three month fellowship. Would you be interested in taking me on as um, as a, as a PhD as a student and she hadn't heard about that scheme because she was so focused on her own research and this is the thing with academics they're so focused on their teaching workload their marking their module design the tests the rest they don't have time to keep up to date with all of these different funding opportunities that's your job so do look at what is available what um what departments you want to work in what projects you want to work on and just ask it's worth a try and this, like I said, is exactly the same in, in industry. It's worth reaching out to people and saying, look, your company is doing amazing work clearing up, you know, X river. 
I am about to finish my PhD project. Is there any scope for um, me joining your department over the next 18 months? Do, you know, hopefully following the tips on the screen and also in the workbooks, hope, you know, it really might get you somewhere. And one thing I do very much want to emphasize is be prepared to chase. Everyone is flooded with their email inboxes. If you're anything like me and, you, and I don't even get that many, but I think I get about 50 emails a day, things get lost. Do chase, obviously at appropriate intervals, don't do it the next day, you know, maybe give them a couple of weeks breathing space and then reapproach them. I actually know one recruiter who will not even consider a speculative application until they've had three emails, because only at that point do they know that that person really wants to work for them and is really motivated. And at that point, it's straight away for an interview. It's, it's that simple. Obviously, everyone has their own kind of tests and foibles, but it's just a kind of quick example, I guess. And then applying for industry. So this is a, a relatively typical pathway. Things might have changed a little bit uh, with COVID, but this was the kind of classical route as, uh, as I know it. So um, again, your kind of CV, your interviews, um, your situational and your strength based and your competency um, questions. And again, hopefully the guides will help with those. But as our wonderful panelists have really emphasized today, when you're applying for industry with your PhD, and sorry if you can hear my dog scratching the carpet in the background, he's uh, making his nest, no idea why, so I do apologize. Uh, it's all about how you market yourself and how you don't just think about your research projects, but how you think about that broader skills, your broader ski skill set. So yes, you can talk about how the finer points of your PhD research relates to the job, but what you might want to do is think about those research skills. So your GIS, your LIDAR, your remote sensing, your field work, your um, report writing, your grant um, applications, all of these things fit under the bracket of your PhD research. So pick out little parts of it that have given you these transferable skills and market them, emphasize them on your CV. Um, don't just have you know, a big chunky paragraph that basically explains your PhD project full of a load of jargon. Take that out in very concise bullet points. Talk about your skills. So, you know, successfully applied for a, a £2,000 BSG um, career priming uh, grant uh, to work on X project or, uh, you know, completed field work abroad, independently writing risk assessments, liaising with insurance um, departments and organizing overseas travel. Because all of those things show your project management skills. They show your verbal and written communication skills, your time management skills. It's all really, really relevant. So it's all about how you market your PhD on your CV uh, cover letter application questions. The next point is a little bit of a weird one that nobody really seems to emphasize on their applications, but do you bring useful networks with you? If you know people who, uh, you know, whether it's in academic institutions, whether you've done work placements, whether you've collaborated internationally on a paper, you've no idea what that company is actually looking for, where they're expanding to next, what their future projects are, what their future vision is. So you kind of saying that you've worked on these um, interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary projects, or you've worked with overseas stakeholders and, and things like that, really can um, be a huge selling point when you're writing your application. So don't miss out things like that. And do mention professional memberships and professional bodies and uh, conferences and things that you've attended, not just for their, um, it, when you're applying for academic roles, they're seen as kind of, um, almost like currency, within industry, these uh, conferences and your papers still have huge value. It's just all about how you sell them to your employer. And then um, the final one is a kind of a bit obvious, but it's have you gained useful qualifications, um, trainings, accreditations? So I myself, I went and uh, did a jolly and went did some four by four Lantra training, which was a great fun day out, um, wrapping around in a, in a Land Rover Defender. But that is a very useful uh, qualification if, uh, you know, if I want to work in the field, having that certification and that accreditation is really helpful. And um, if you, you know, in this kind of COVID world where, uh, a lot of people who have these fieldwork budgets, you might not be utilizing them on overseas fieldwork, but you might want to be able to repurpose them into, you know, paying for accreditations and paying for training. Um, I know that all of you uh, might be at the later stages of your PhD, but, you know, if you can repurpose that um, RTSG, then do think about it. 
Now I know I've uh, run way over time, so I will just leave you with one final kind of piece of advice. The number one reason people are rejected from jobs now is because they do not follow the instructions on the application. They either don't supply the right supplementary documents, whether that's a writing sample or a reference statement, they miss out application questions or they put NA for application questions. Um, they um, apply either too early or too late to the job. You know, there's usually set windows. So just read the job application um, just uh, it's usually sometimes it's a word document sometimes it's actually within the um the specification itself but read it engage in it and show them that you've read it what i like to advise people to do is actually pick out the key words from that job application and mention them in your cv and cover letter and use the synonyms for those keywords in your cv and cover letter because then again they know that you've read it they know that you are applying to them specifically so I, unfortunately, I won't uh, drone on any much longer um, about the kind of marketing yourself um, aspect. But like I said, um, we will be sending out these guidebooks after the session and um, hopefully those give you some really, really uh, actual tangible advice of exactly how 